Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to go back about six years and revisit a sermon we preached from this part of the Bible. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Once you find it, you'll recognize it. Matthew 6, verses 9 to 13. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Many of you were taught as children, either by your parents or by the church you were attending, either Catholic or Protestant, to recite what's been called the Lord's Prayer. Probably very few texts are as well known in the world as this one. It's the, it's the one text you can always depend on Hollywood to throw in uh, at some climactic scene in a movie. Some guy gets shot and he's laying there in the street about to die. And the last words he utters are, Our Father, which art in heaven, you know, and his eyes close. It's either that or the 23rd Psalm. And unsaved people may not know any place, else, anything else in the Bible, but they do know this part. They're familiar with this passage. Let me say that I have never been in the habit of reciting the Lord's Prayer in some regular fashion. And uh, I'm not in the habit of reciting it now. I mean, I know it because I've heard it so often, but I, I don't normally recite it as part of my devotions, nor do I plan to get into the habit of reciting it habitually. And if you're at all interested in why I say that, then you're in luck, because that's what I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> I call this rightly dividing the Lord's Prayer. I want you to observe a few things from it. First of all, observe uh, that it's misnamed. It's misnamed. What's called the Lord's Prayer isn't really the Lord's Prayer, but it's the disciples' prayer. Verse 9 says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Notice verse 5 earlier. When thou prayest. Verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest. Verse 7. But when ye pray. The more correct Lord's Prayer would be the prayer that takes up virtually all of John chapter 17, that Christ prayed with his disciples the night he was betrayed before he was arrested and then crucified the next morning. So this was not a prayer Jesus ever prayed himself, but he was, it was given to the disciples to pray. So first of all, let me say it's misnamed. Secondly, let me say this. It's not a magic formula. It's not a magic formula. These four verses were never given as a specific set of words to be memorized and then recited whenever you're in a jam, whenever you're in a tight spot. You don't know what else to do. But might as well recite the Lord's Prayer. Uh, I work for a funeral home during the week, and we go to a lot of churches, and there's some churches out there. During the course of their funeral service or ceremony, the minister will lead everybody in the Lord's Prayer. When the service is done, we transport everything over to the cemetery for the final conclusion. And once again, the minister will lead everyone in the Lord's. It's, the guy doesn't know what else to say. He has nothing to offer. He has no prayer to pray. He doesn't know God. And so he just asks people to keep reciting the thing that they recited earlier that day. Millions of people have been conditioned almost to pray this as though it was commanded by the Lord Jesus to say these specific words, like a good luck charm, some lucky coin. You rub it, hoping for something positive to happen to you. But uh, it's an example of prayer and what a good prayer should consist of, how a good prayer should be constructed. Jesus said in verse 9, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Christ never said, repeat after me, ready, begin. No, he didn't start off that way. So it's not a magic formula. 
It was a pattern for the disciples to follow. Uh, they needed to be taught. They asked in uh, Luke chapter 11, Lord, teach us to pray. They needed to be taught. Let me say, you can't read the instructions on a cake mix and then claim that you've baked a cake. Nor can you simply read the components of a model prayer and say that you've prayed. And also, since the prayer only takes about 20, 22 seconds, are you saying that's all the time God asks of us? Are we to believe that's all the time God uh, desires of us, that he requires of us? And then we can call it prayer. We can say, I've prayed. I realize a lot of people have these daily devotionals, you know, our daily bread or something like that. And it, it's, it's very succinct, it's to the point, it's, it's for the purpose of making devotions and your time with God very quick before you're out the door on your way to work. And uh, for crying out loud, are you telling me that all you have to do is talk to God for 20 seconds by reciting something that you learned in kindergarten and then say, well, my prayer is done, now what, what's next? What do I do now? But after Christ spent all night in prayer before choosing his disciples, Luke 12, when the Apostle Paul admonishes us to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, he said to the Thessalonians, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face, 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. Is 20 or 22 seconds all God requires of us before he promises to act? to grant our petition, to respond to our prayer requests, to respond to our needs. James writes, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5, verse 16. It should seem self-evident that after this manner, therefore, pray ye, and then he lists uh, 20 seconds worth of praying, that does not constitute prayer. That's simply a description of elements that ought to go into a good prayer. One of the greatest biographies um, in Christian history is that of George Mueller. I've talked about George Mueller to you before. George Mueller uh, was a German, but he ran an orphanage in London, England in the, in the 1830s, 1835, 1840, long through there. And at one time, George Mueller had 700 widows and their children under his charge. And he took upon himself the responsibility to care for these people, to make sure they had food to eat, a place to sleep, a roof over their head, day after day after day. And George Mueller decided he would never go out publicly and beg or ask people for money. He would simply pray that God would move on someone's heart to come by and put money in the donation box he had outside the entrance and trust that that would be enough to get his people through. And uh, day after day, and week after week, and month after month, and year after year, money would come. He would pray, and he'd go check the box, and there would be just enough to buy milk and to buy meat and food for these people. And they estimate by modern economic uh, standards, George Mueller prayed in two and a half million dollars in the 1830s, 1840s, and never went out publicly and asked for a penny. He would simply pray, and God would move on the heart of somebody who knew about Mueller's work, and they would go by and put money anonymously in that box. Do you think George Mueller only recited the Lord's Prayer for 20 seconds and then expected God to answer? No. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much. But uh, when Jesus tells his disciples, after this manner, it ought to be abundantly clear that he's not telling them, now just say what I say. That's far from the truth. When you pray, he says, first of all, our Father which art in heaven. You ought to be able to say God is your Father and know what that means as a sinner who's been forgiven by a loving father. When the Lord Jesus spoke these words, however, he was addressing a Jewish audience still living in Old Testament times before the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When he said these things to them, 
There was no crucifixion yet. There was no church age yet. There was no New Testament uh, uh, bride of Christ yet in the world. You have to keep that in mind when you read through the scriptures. That's why we talk about rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. God tells you what to do, study. He tells you uh, why you're supposed to do it, to be not be ashamed and to be approved before God. And he tells you how you're supposed to study, by rightly dividing the word of truth. Compare scripture with scripture. Let these scriptures interpret themselves and understand who's speaking, to whom are they speaking, and about what are they speaking. Does it apply to you directly or was it intended for somebody else? By the way, and it bears repeating, your King James Bible is the only Bible in the world that tells you to study. All the modern translations have rewritten it. Some of them simply say, do your best. That's very open-ended. Anybody can say, I'm doing my best. But most people understand the difference between studying and not studying. The Jews were allowed to call God their father collectively as a nation. Isaiah 63 verse 16 said, Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. And Isaiah 64 verse 8 said, But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay and thou art our potter, and we are the work of thy hand. For you, however, God is only your father if you've been born again as a son of God. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, John 1 verse 12. Uh, it's no longer a collective thing for the sinner who comes to the Savior. The Bible says, uh, for we must all, um, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Romans 14, verse 12. Thirdly today, let me say this. Not only is it misnamed, not only is it not a magic formula, but thirdly, it's a model. It is a model. You and I have to be very careful to understand this prayer spiritually, when it comes to us, for our devotional benefit, for some inspiration God can give us from it. But uh, technically, it was addressed to a Jewish audience alone. Just as you understand this much that the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, was given to the nation of Israel was never addressed to a New Testament church believer. But don't you and I reach back to the Old Testament over and over and over again and receive some instruction, some enlightenment, some blessing uh, from those things we read, especially the book of Psalms, Proverbs, those admonitions, those words of wisdom that God gave to David and Solomon and other parts of the Bible, don't they ring true with you? and your relationship to God time and time again. But technically they weren't addressed to you, but you certainly can benefit from them. So it is in the New Testament, the Gospels, Christ preached to a Jewish audience before he was ever crucified on Calvary. And those books, it's like the book of Revelation, the general epistles leading up to it, which will apply to somebody long after the rapture takes place, you still reach into those parts of the Bible and and apply them to yourself devotionally and for spiritual benefit over and over again. So we don't dismiss those things, but we don't say they apply to us hard and fast uh, uh, rules that apply to you and I. But uh, this should be clear from the way the Lord Jesus uh, contrasted Jews and Gentiles in the Sermon on the Mount. Look uh, later at verses 31 and 32. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, 
or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For, all, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father, Jews, knoweth that ye have need of all these things. So Christians have to study this prayer devotionally and take from it those things that can be an inspirational blessing uh, to us. When you pray, you should never forget who it is you're addressing. So God certainly needs to be your heavenly Father. God Almighty is pure. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed, holy be thy name. So we can say, hallowed be thy name. God had said, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we agree with that. We can call God our Father by the new birth, and we agree that He is holy, and His name is holy. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So anyone who does not regard the importance of the word of God as it's written on the page in front of his face is a heretic. God puts the esteem, the importance of his words higher than the value and the importance of his own name. And anyone that doesn't believe that, anyone thinks, well, all translations are basically the same and they're all kind of telling the basic truth. Well, how about this? So is the Jehovah Witness Bible part of the Word of God? Is that what you're saying? Most Christians wouldn't go that far with it. See, they haven't thought it through. You better figure out what the Word of God is and stick with it because there may be a test. You better be ready for it. You want to be ready for it when that day comes. Well, next he said, thy kingdom come. That's a separate sentence. Let's address that by itself. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. You enter into the very moment you trust Jesus Christ to become your savior. The moment of your conversion, you become a member or you become a citizen of the kingdom of God. Paul says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Those are physical things. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Romans 14 verse 17. It's a spiritual kingdom you become a part of at the moment of your conversion. The Jews, however, were looking for a literal, physical, visible, messianic kingdom here on the earth. We refer to that as the kingdom of heaven. And that will come. Jesus Christ will reign from the city of Jerusalem when he returns. But no Christian was ever told to pray that it will come. You became a citizen of the kingdom of heaven the moment you trusted Christ and entered into the kingdom of God. Once you entered into the kingdom of God by the new birth, you're qualified for the, the kingdom of heaven when it finally shows up. But those two kingdoms are distinct. One is within and the other will be without. And that's the one the Jews were anticipating. Wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Acts chapter 1. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, Christ said. So the Jews had every right to expect a physical, visible kingdom. And we said, pray that it'll come. Pray that it will come. You and I pray that others will enter the kingdom of God, like we did, as sinners who needed to be forgiven, sinners who need to be saved from the consequence of our sin. He says, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Well, nobody doubts that God's will gets done in heaven, do they? But getting his will done here on the earth, that's where the problem is. How yielded to him are you? Does God have control of your hands? Does he have control of your feet? Does he have control of your mind? Does he have control of your mouth? Does he have control of your eyes? Does he have control of your ears? Does he have control of the affections and the attitude of your heart and your thought life? Does he have control of your bodily gestures and your movements 
and the things you do to indicate honesty or uh, deception. Getting his will done on the earth is where the trouble comes in. Verse 11 says, give us this day our daily bread. You know, every day is new with God. You can't live today based on yesterday's blessings. You need a new blessing from God today. And just as you ate yesterday, you're going to want to eat again today. Christ uh, says later in this chapter, verse 34, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I mean, even Alcoholics Anonymous slogan is one day at a time. So you can't worry about the past and you can't perfectly predict the future. Uh, give us this day so we can go that far with it. There's an object lesson. You know how the Jews had to go out every day and gather fresh manna each morning. You recall that they kept it up uh, until the, the day after, it would breed worms and stink. It would, it would decay and go bad that quickly. And in a way, if the Word of God is described as the bread of life, and it is, then you want to get something new from the Bible every day. That's why we encourage people to read their Bible every day. I can give you recommendations. We can give you a Bible reading guide, a chart. We can recommend so many chapters each day and work your way through. But uh, I can't force you to read your Bible so many chapters each morning. But you ought to be reading it little by little every day. Work your way through from cover to cover. The first time I ever read through my Bible from cover to cover and I completed it, I realized how many wonderful things I had come across, having done so, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go back and do it again. So you go back and you start all over again. I figured out if, if you read, my father used to give this challenge, if you read three chapters a day, maybe five chapters on Sunday, you can complete the entire Bible in exactly one year. 1,189 chapters in the Bible. So I sat down and figured if I can read eight chapters every day of the week, then I can go through my Bible twice in a year with 25 unused days left over. And I sat down and figured, well, if I can read through three, uh, 10 chapters every day, seven days a week, then I'll go through my Bible three times in a year with eight days to spare. And that's how I began reading for several years after that. And you never exhaust the Word of God. It'll exhaust you. But there's always something new to be seen, to be discovered. You come across a part of the Bible that jumps out at you and you say, why didn't I notice that before? Well, nothing had changed in the Bible. It's something changed in you. Something in you was different this time than it was the last time you were reading through it. The events of your life, the different circumstances in your job, your family, your home, uh, etc. Those things change you. And now that verse ministers to you in a way it, it didn't before. But you should get something new from the Word of God every day. Give us this day our daily bread. Notice there's an order that the prayer should follow. First, the kingdom of God is asked for, or the kingdom for the Jew would be in the kingdom of heaven, before any personal requests are made. You know, a man needs to know that he's right with God before he has any business asking God to give me something, give me this, give me that. Asking for favors and materialism. Look at verse 33 later on. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, physical, shall be added unto you. And now a Christian can go along with a prayer up to verse 11 fairly easily. We can find plenty of inspiration from these verses here. 
But here in verse 12, we're going to hit a, a speed bump that will bounce you out of your seat if you're not buckled in. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. A lot of people recite it as forgive us our trespasses. But if you look at verses 14 and 15, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So uh, in a way, I'll say either trespass or debt is acceptable for our purposes today. We're studying the book of Matthew uh, week by week in our Sunday school Bible study hour. And we started last September. This is what, September? Seven months later, and we've just reached chapter 5. So you see how quickly I'm going with it each week. You go to some of these modern contemporary churches. They have a lot of radio programs on where they're teaching. The, they, their announcer always promises they're going to go deep in a verse-by-verse -verse study, dude, into the Word of God. And uh, they'll take on a book like Matthew, and they go through 28 chapters, and they're done in about four weeks. You're in the, how deep did they really go? But the problem for the born-again, regenerated believer in Christ, your sins are not forgiven on the condition or on the basis that you have forgiven someone else first. And I would dare say, you probably want God to forgive you better than you would forgive someone else. If he forgave you to the same degree you forgive someone else, you, you give them lip service and you're forcing yourself to say, I forgive you. But down inside, you, you know, who knows if you really forgive them or not. Do you want God to forgive you that way? Probably not. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. It may not always be possible for you to find someone who's wronged you and let them know that you forgive them. They might not even care. But your sins are forgiven when you admit to them and you confess them and uh, turn from them. That's what we call repentance. Recognizing that you were in the wrong and you want to turn around and go the other way. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9. Look over at Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm trying, going to try to move along quickly. I'm almost finished. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, notice verses 31 and 32. Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We ought to forgive others because we've received such great forgiveness from the Lord God. But it is not a condition for you to get forgiveness if you sufficiently forgive someone else first. But now, practically speaking, you should be quick and ready to forgive someone so you're not a hypocrite when you come to God and ask Him to forgive you. Also, this model of prayer, um, you ought to pray that God will help you to avoid sin and avoid the circumstances that lead to temptation and sin. Verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I wonder how many people pray that way anymore. Some people seem to think that if they're saved, if they have a testimony of having trusted Christ, they'll know what's right and wrong. They'll let their conscience be their guide. They'll be able to navigate their way through life without being destroyed by temptation uh, or sin. And uh, they'll know the right decision at all times by the Holy Spirit. You're underestimating the power of your own flesh. The flesh is strong. Just when you think you're making the right decision, turns out you're making a selfish decision because of your flesh. But at the moment, you didn't realize it. You need God's help. You need God's help. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, 
walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Romans 13, verse 14. You ought to pray continually that God will give you good judgment and boldness uh, and strength to not give in every time some temptation comes your way, some enticement, some wicked opportunity, some chance to laugh at some dirty joke or some a chance to disgrace the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or disgrace the testimony of other Christians who are looking to you for support, just as you would look to them for support. Let me ask you, what sin, what sin have you just got to commit before this day is over? Is there one that you, you just have to commit or you're going to come apart? What sin is so important to you that you just have to commit it before the night is through? Anyone at all? There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 18. God hates sin, but do you hate sin? Sometimes people have morals, but their motive is wrong. I don't want to fail God. I don't want to disappoint him. I don't want to disgrace him. I don't want him to be embarrassed by me or by my life. There's a story of a Christian girl, Christian teenage girl. She loved the Lord. She had a good father, a good mother, and she wanted to please them. She had a friend from school, wanted her to come over and stay the night at her house. One Friday night, she said, listen, tell your dad that, that you're going to come spend the night at my house. She said, my, my parents go to bed early. When they go to bed, you and I can sneak out. So-and-so is having a party at their house. Sounds like a lot of fun. You and I can go down there and have really live it up tonight. <laughs> really just have a good time. And the Christian girl said, I, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. Oh, come on. We'll be all right. No, I, I don't want to do that. I can't do that. And the friend says, well, are you afraid of what your father will do to you if he finds out? And the Christian girl said, no. I'm afraid of what it will do to him if he finds out. God has done so much for you, and he loves you so much. He has high hopes for you and great expectations of you. He wants you to live in such a way that honors God and pleases the Lord Jesus Christ as a life of gratitude and thankfulness and appreciation and devotion and praise for everything you have as a child of God, why would you want to go out and disgrace him? Why would you want to embarrass the name of Jesus Christ or bring shame to your fellow believers by association? God hates sin, but you and I hate sin. And lastly, <clears throat> when you pray, you should never lose sight of the fact that it's the Lord who allows you to come to him as, a, as the creator of the universe, the sovereign God. There is no other God but him. And he made all of reality. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. The Bible says, Ephesians 3, verse 20. The last part of, the, of verse 13, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Roman Catholic Church leaves that last clause off. So they go from 22 seconds down to about 18 seconds worth of praying. They simply end with deliver us from evil. We should never forget how absolute, how sovereign and powerful the Lord God of the Bible is. 
First, turn, if you will, lastly, to 1 Chronicles 29. 1 Chronicles 29, 29, I'm just about finished, I promise. 1 Chronicles 29, notice there verse 11. 1 Chronicles 29, that's in the Old Testament right after 1 Chronicles 28. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11 says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness, notice, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Uh, a Jewish prayer given to a Jewish audience probably uh, is a, probably supposed to have that ending on it. So I don't know why they decided it needed to be left out, but they did. 22 seconds is more than some people can uh, afford. So let's whittle it down to about 18 seconds. This is how you and I should esteem God when we pray, so we can go that far devotionally for our sake. It's a wonderful model of prayer. It's a wonderful pattern to follow. As I said, it's not a prayer that anyone was told to memorize and then recite by, by rote. Let me bring this to a conclusion and say, the Lord Jesus said, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. He gave them a model of prayer. He gave them a pattern. He gave them a, a list of, of elements that ought to be included in a good prayer to God. But he never said, repeat after me. He said, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. They think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So he said, uh, when you pray, don't just say the same thing over and over again. And that's what heathen people do. But when you pray, pray something like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, and so forth. He gives, them, gives it to them. And the very prayer Jesus told them not to repeat is the one they all insist on repeating. So in a way, you could say every time someone recites that prayer because they think Christ commanded it, they are actually disobeying Christ. Was Jesus Christ God in the flesh? Were the words of Christ the words of God? So when someone recites this prayer habitually, they are sinning against the very words of God. Because he said, that's not the way you pray. That's not the way you approach God. Just reciting the same thing repeatedly. So really, when someone recites that, thinking they've prayed, they don't know God. They've never been introduced to God. They don't know him. They can't say he's their father. They have no intimate relationship with him. They've never been born again. 